Good evening. Right, um, Art Hostage back here for an unexpected another episode. Right, I've just seen Tony Connolly has just responded. Right, I don't think he wrote it himself, right, because he's still having trouble with light switches. Right, he's wrote here, cease and desist, right, fucking stand and deliver, right. You have posted malicious falsehoods concerning myself and my businesses that amount to defamation and libel. I insist on a full deletion of all the defaming statements and posts and the removal of all statements in regard to myself and my businesses within 24 hours. 24 hours till Tulsa, eh? If these malicious falsehoods are not removed, I will instruct my lawyers to issue court proceedings against you. I have photographed all the posts, all of the posts, and will use them in evidence, will you now? Okay. Right, so there's 24 hours. Right, okay, I'll agree. I will remove all malicious falsehoods. And the only falsehood in any of those posts is that I might have spelt your name um, Connolly, C-O-N-N-O-L-L-Y, rather than the true spelling of C-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. Everything else on there is true, Tony. So don't start all the bollocks, mate. I was there. I saw it with my own two eyes. You told me your life history over a number of years. Okay. So now what we do, okay, we'll do the Tony Pon Connolly. We will do the Tony Connolly podcast part one now. Okay. Right. Now, here we go. Let's go down then. Right. Here we go. Right. Anthony Mark Connolly, right, was born on the 10th of, of January, 10th of January, 1958, in Easter House in Glasgow, to his mother, Sue, and an unknown father, right, Tony Connolly told me years later that his, his mother, Sue, would narrow it down to eight blokes, so he had a one in eight chance, anyway, right, Sue Connolly hooked up with um, Scotch John Ferry, that was his nickname, people called him Scotch John, right, right, a rapist, right, and they moved to Brighton in the 1970s into a terraced house in Toronto Terrace, Brighton. Scotch John Ferry was an awful, evil man, right, and he made Tony Connolly and his two sisters eat porridge three times a day for about four years in the 70s, honestly, yeah. While he used to go out drinking with Sue Connolly, he'd leave the kids there. Porridge, porridge, three times a day. You think I'm kidding? It's true, right? Scotch John Ferry used to work for Mickey Dawes. He's up the Gardner Street yard, right? And then he met a Brighton knocker boy called Alan Walter Friend, Dobby, right? Um, and then they went out on the knocker together. In the summer of 1976, Tony Connolly burgled a casino in Western Road and stole a bag of chips. Right, but not being the sharpest tool in the box, what he tried to do was go back to the casino and cash him in. So they just went, yeah, you're arrested. So anyway, goes to court. He's found guilty, okay, um, and he's sentenced to six to two, six months to two years in Borstal. Right, he comes out of Borstal in 1977, right, and then he goes out on the knocker with um, Scotch John Ferry, his stepdad, and... Um, Alan Walter Friend, um, Dobby, right, and and he's dropping the leaflets through the door, right, you know, and um, I mean, he's on like £10 a day or something, or a fiver a day. In 1980, he started his own crew. He was working with Terry, the Commander Dickens, um, and Jeffrey Meir, right, um, and, and a few other people, and also Scotch John Ferry in Scotland. Right, now, in Scotland, Right, Scotch John Ferry and Tony Connolly used to stay um, at a place, Hamilton, just south of Glasgow, and there was a place there called Hasty's Club, which was almost like a social club, nightclub kind of thing, where they had dancing and all that, and, and, and all kinds of events going on there. Sam, who owned Hasty's, lived across the road, and he would let um, Scotch John Ferry and um, Tony Connolly stay there when they were up on the knocker. Well, one night, Scotch John Ferry right, um, gets a 13-year-old virgin girl back to the house um, in Hamilton and brutally rapes her, okay? 
Now, the girl, after this happens, right, um, Scott John leaves the room, and Tony Connolly goes in the room. This is his own words. He told me. He sat down on the bed, right, and the girl's bleeding and crying and all that sort of carry on. And he said, he said, oh, I felt sorry for her, okay, and he made her commit sex acts on him, right, jerked him off, right. I was, like, in shock when he told me, right. And, right, so that's that story sorted out, okay. Right. Now, after that, okay, Tony Connolly started working in the 1980s with a man called Mickey Bradley, who owned Clyde Corner Antiques, okay, in Clyde Road, Brighton, next to the fire station, okay, and they used to go out on the knocker, right, and they would be stealing things all the time, and Mickey Bradley used to sell all the stuff and launder it through the auction houses using his um, pseudonym, George Barker, okay, now you're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds, worth of stolen art and antiques, went through Sullivan's, Christie's, Phillips, right, through Mickey Bradley, uh, using his bogus name, George Barker at Clyde Corner Antiques, okay? Now, Mickey Bradley, right, he's another wrong one. He was, he's dead now, but he was a wrong one, right? He got this, got hold of a girl when she was 12 years old and he raped her, but he, but he kept on seeing her until she was of age and he ended up marrying this girl and had a kid. But anyway, that's another story, okay? 1987, right? Anthony Connolly, Tony Connolly, is working with uh, Dobby, Alan Walter Friend, in Scotland, just south of Edinburgh. And they come across these art collectors called Mr. and Mrs. Stevens, right? They've got a house full of art and antiques, you know, hundreds of paintings, furniture. And in the garage, they've got two vintage cars. There was a drop-bed Bentley, and there was an Elvis, which was a convertible, A-L-V-I-S, which Tony Connolly, I think he's probably still got it to this day, right? They had a genuine deal with uh, Mr. and Mrs. C Stevens, and they gave gave them £50,000, okay? And then they brought all the 48 paintings, or uh, 50, 55 paintings or something they bought, the two cars and another lot of gear, right? I'll tell you the story another time about how, um, how, what, what happened to all the gear when they sold it, but that was all straight gear, okay? This is, that was 87. In 1988, Tony Connolly, get, he got convicted of an attempted distraction burglary um, with Danny Newman in Weymouth, and he got 30 months jail time, right? So he goes into jail um, in 1988. He gets released in 1989, right, a year later. He's then up in London with Dixie Dean and Alan Walter Friend, Dobby, Right, and they all get caught stealing some jewellery, really small amount, £300 worth. Right? There was surveillance on them at the time, and I'll tell you another story about that. They go to court, Connolly, because he's breaking the terms of his release at the time, he gets two and a half years in jail. Right, So now, this is um, October 8, 1989. He's in jail, and he, he serves the whole sentence in Wormwood Scrubs, because he gets in with the um, prison officers, and because he's low category, a D category, right, he's, um, he ends up living in outside the prison in a sort of halfway house where he put a bit of carpet on the floor and he used to get his wife and his mistress to come up and see him and couldn't and do all them visit things and all that game. Right, anyway, Tony Connolly gets released in January 1991, right? He then goes back up to Scotland. Now, he's got a big ginger beard, right, at this time when he gets released from jail. Great big, huge ginger, bright ginger beard, right? He goes up to see Mr. and Mrs. Stevens again, right, to try and have another deal with them and buy some more art off of them. And they said, we're very sorry, we've got nothing for sale. Um, no, you know, we don't want to sell anything else, right? Connolly, right, undeterred, then recruits a violent, violent burglar, right, from Scotland, from Glasgow, to go and burgle the Stevens home. This burglar and someone else go and burgles the Stevens home, and during the burglary, Mrs. Stevens dies. Fucking dies. Right, the burglars leave forensics or whatever when they clear off, and the police investigate the murder, right, they arrest the burglars, right, charge them with murder, they're in jail, they interview Tony Connolly, Right, he says no comment on that, and there's no evidence against him, and the burglars won't turn on him. So they have to release Tony Connolly through lack of evidence, but they know he was the one that set it up anyway, right? But they can't prove that. The two burglars who were involved in it, they both get life sentences, 
and Connolly gets away with it. Alan Walter Frame Dobby, he was also interviewed, right, about the uh, murder of Mrs. Stevens, right, and even though every time in his whole life he gets interviewed, he was all, he would always say no comment, no comment, no comment. In this instance, he, right, you know, he was open and honest. He went, I don't know fucking nothing about it. Yes, I did have a deal in 1987 with Tony Connolly, with Mr. and Mrs. Stevens, but I haven't been back since. I haven't had a deal. I know nothing about it. You know, and whatever Tony Connolly does is nothing to do with me. You know, he's just been released from jail and I'm doing whatever. I'm on the knocker down in the West Country or whatever, right? Okay, so then Tony Connolly, right, gets released and gets away with murder, right? Okay, so now we're going to move on, right? Now, there's a bit of a gap, right, and, but I'll fill it in later. But we get to 1997. Tony Connolly recruits Duncan Cousins and a German woman, right, to go and see an old man in Twickenham and put drug sleeping tablets in his cup of tea, right, and that, which they did, right, and then when the, when the old man fell asleep, Duncan Cousins and the German woman, right, stole all of his antiques, uh, marketry, grandfather clock, loads of um, jewellery and all kinds of other things. But Duncan Cousins and, and the, um, the, uh, the, the German woman, who was uh, pretending she was a nurse, Right, um, they got arrested again, left forensics or something, went to court. Right, nothing against Connolly, he right, he slipped out of it again. Okay, um, and they got seven years each in jail. Tony Connolly he escapes again. Right now, in 1998, Tony Connolly's working with Robert Dixie Dean. Right, and they find this old gentleman in Pimlico in London and they befriend him. Right, so then what they do, Tony Connolly conspires, right, to take the old, the old gentleman out to lunch and, uh, with Dixie Dean. And while they're out to lunch, they, get, they, they paid someone else to go and set a light to his house, which duly happened. So they're at lunch with the old gentleman. As they go to take him back, they see the fire engines all outside the old gentleman's house and their hoses and all that, and it's all black and smoke and all that, and it's terrible. So then Tony Connolly, the bastard who actually organised the fire, says to the old gentleman, would you like to come down to Hove and stay with me at one of my big houses, right, the one in Old Shoreham Road, okay, while um, your house gets decorated, and in fact, me and uh, uh, Dixie Dean will organise the rede redecorating and the refurbishing of your house. Well, the old boy, he didn't know nothing, the old man. I mean, he thought that the people were doing him a favour, right? He didn't realise that this was part of a big conspiracy. So anyway, he goes down to the old Shoreham Road Hove and stays with Connolly, and he gets the house all done up lovely. While he's got the old boy down there, right, he gets, he gets a brand new will made up from the old boy, leaving Tony Connolly the whole estate. Now, the old boy owned the house in Pimlico, and he had over a million pound in the bank. Right, the only um, fly in the ointment for Tony Connolly's plan, right, would be the family of the old gentleman who are very high profile in the horse racing world, right? So, after they've, um, uh, he's got a new will, okay, he gets it and he puts it in the bank, right? So, all of a sudden, boom, 1999, the old gentleman dies, right? And Tony Connolly then produces the will, right? And that is met with outrage by the relatives of the gentleman, right, who are prominent people in the horse racing world. So anyway, they, they take Tony Connolly to court, and it goes to court. And then that refers back to my um, um, earlier post I did about Simon Muggleton. Do you remember Simon Muggleton? When Tony Connolly's at court and Simon Muggleton sidles up to him on the wall and says, look, Tony, um, you know, um, I'm not with the Art and Antique Squad now. 99 member, yeah, right. I'm not with the Art and Antique Squad. I'm with the Sussex Police Force Intelligence Bureau now. But here's my card, you know, if you get any intelligence, you know, um, and, and Tony Connolly went, no, 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 I'm not interested. He took the card. Six months later, he phones up Simon Muggleton and says, what am I going to get if I sign up to be um, a registered informant with the Sussex Police Force Intelligence Bureau. Well, Simon Muggleton met him, set him, signed him up, right, and then I'll go into that another time, right? Okay, so, so this is 99, right? They're at the court, the horse racing people, right? Um, the horse racing world people, I'm not going to name them just yet, right? Um, or the old man in Pimlico just yet, right? Um, 
the, the um, court hearing decides that Tony Connolly's version of the will, okay, takes precedent over the previous version and Tony Connolly wins the day. So he gets the house, the million quid in the bank and all the up, where well, he gets the old man in Pimlico's estate, right? The thing is with the house, though, it's not normal, right? He's got a lease on it, right? No, he don't own the freehold. He's got a nine-year lease. He's got a lease on it that's got nine years left, right? That's all it's got left on it. But Tony Connolly, right, um, what he does is he then applies under the right to buy scheme to buy the house, and he's got nine years left on the lease. So then the house was valued at £1.2 million, but Tony Connolly got it for £900,000. And he used the money from the will of you know the mill to pay for the house nine hundred grand. He comes out of hundred grand in his back pocket, okay. And so now he owns the house, right? This is nineteen ninety nine, okay. We go forward to 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, Tony Connolly, right, sells the house for two point four million pound, right. And then what he does. Right, is he then starts investing in slum flat, flats in Brighton, Worthing, Hove, right, uh, right, and since then his uh, property portfolio, right, is now worth probably ten million quid. Okay, in two thousand and nine, oh, and Dixie Dean, right? Well, now don't forget Tony Connolly's getting all these millions for the house, right? Now Dixie Dean was part of the conspiracy, right? But Tony Connolly employed delaying tactics, delaying tactics, and Dixie Dean knew he was going to get nothing out of it. So in the end, Dixie Dean said to Tony Connolly, give me £20,000 and I'm out of it, right? And then Tony Connolly gave him £20,000 and then he walked away with the two million quid, right? You know, you can imagine what anyone else would have done. Do you know what I mean? Dobby or anyone would like that. You know what I mean? They'd have stuck a gun in his mouth and said, really, Ginge, really, Ginger Connolly, you really think you're going to get two million and give me 20 grand? But anyway, right? So, so, so Dixie got rode out of the... 2.4 million pound house in Pimlico. Now in 2009, right, Dixie Dean contracted a rare blood disorder and Connolly took out a life insurance policy on Dixie Dean but, but got it illegally backdated. Okay, right, now in 2011, Dick, Robert Dixie Dean died in May 2011 and Anthony Mark Connolly collected £500,000 life insurance money from a fraudulent claim, okay, another half a million he's done out of Dixie, and he never gave a penny to the relatives of Dixie Dean, not a shilling, not a shilling, right, okay, now after that, don't forget, we've also got to throw in the mix the other things that Tony Connolly has been doing through his life and getting away with it, right, we've already got him, we've already got him, um, sexually abusing a 13 year old back in Hasties, we've already got him murdering Mrs, um, Mrs. Stevens, right, I've got loads of stories in the 80s where he robbed people and all this carry on, right? Um, oh, in 1993, Tony Connolly and Dixie Dean are in Scotland and they get hold of this young lad working for the auctioneers who's got a cocaine habit and they feed him cocaine and he starts giving them target addresses to go and rob and a list of what the stuff is in there. They're getting bundles of gear, bundles of gear, bundles of gear. Anyway, the Scottish police do an undercover operation and they swoop on them all and they find, I don't know, uh, 40, 50 different pieces from like 30 burglaries or something like that. Tony Connolly and Dixie Dean go on remand in um, Scotland, right, on all these conspiracy charges and that. But what happened, the police have made some kind of mistake with their, what, their surveillance or something like that, or was an illegal warrant or whatever this can carry on. Right, and they ended up having to drop the charges, but it was a huge case in Scotland, and the Scottish police weren't happy at Tony Connolly because they had a long memory and remember that he was responsible for the murder of Mrs. Stevens. Right, now that but back in 1991, this is 19, uh, sorry, sorry, 91, this is two years later in 1993, uh, 1993, okay. So they wanted his blood, but anyway, all of a sudden, boom, he manages to slip out of it. Okay, now boom, Tony Connolly's had a contact in Hull for for 30 years, all right, a man called Melvin Spongemouth Anderson, right, now he was a sort of lowly antique dealer for donkey's years, right, and he used to give Tony Connolly target addresses, and Tony Connolly would organise the theft, and they, was, they, they were friends, right, 
Tony Connolly then become a millionaire. But then Melvin Anderson, he owned the shop, right? Um, he owned his shop in Hull and he owned the building as well. It's all run down and everything. But developers came to see him and they offered him £2 million for the whole building. Well, you can imagine, do you know what I mean? Melvin Anderson, he ripped their arm off and hit him with a soggy end. So now Melvin Anderson's got £2 million. So he goes out and he buys a boat for 75 grand, 75,000, right? And he starts smuggling drugs in it. Yeah, 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 fucking smuggling drugs, right? And they employ Dave Bishop, David Bishop, right, who's got a fish and chip shop, uh, to open a fish and chip shop, right? Now, Dave Bishop, right, was um, is the elder brother of the double child killer, Russell Bishop, and he's another very close good friend of Tony Connolly. Tony Connolly's used him for burglaries and, and armed robberies and, and armed um, art heists and all that carry on. Okay, so um, so all of a sudden you've got Melvin, right, and Dave Bishop smuggling the drugs. It comes to this country and they sell them straight off wholesale. They don't want to get involved in all that fucking street shit, right? So they buy them per kilo, sell them um, uh, abroad, sell them per kilo and then take the money. Dave Bishop is laundering through his fish and chip shop. Tony Connolly is laundering through his property company. And then Tony Connolly in 2002 opens up an eBay account called Georgian House Collectibles. Okay. And from 2002 till today, he's sold over 55,000 antiques. Okay. Legitimately sold them through his eBay page, but he sold probably the same amount right, to collectors that he's met through eBay offline that have stolen and all this kind of carryings on, right? So he's been using that to launder stolen art and antiques since 2002. It's millions and millions of pounds worth, right? Okay, so, so, so now Tony Con right, Tony Connolly's right. So now Melvin, right, Melvin and Tony Connolly and um, Dave Bishop, right, um, are in the drug game, so laundering the money, so the antiques are taking a bit of a back step. All of a sudden, bubbly bubbly bum, we're seeing, right, there's quite a few robberies that have gone down, right? We've had, what what, what, did we, what have we had? We've had the Arundel uh, theft last year using ladders, okay? Mary Queen of Scots Rosary went missing, right? We had, um, uh, we've had the Portland Tiara, right? We had the Rembrandts, right? The failed one, they got the Rembrandts out, but had to drop them when the... Um, um, security guards came out at Dulwich. We've had um, the Van Dyke theft from Christ College, right? What else we had, right? All using ladders, right? Now, Dave Bishop's brother, um, Mickey Bishop, owns a, um, a roofing company, right? <laughs> but like million and one ladders, right? You know what I mean? Anyway, right? So, all of these things have been going down, and everything I've been saying is 100% true. So, Tony Connolly, you're obviously going to hear this, right? All I've got to say to you is don't be scared. Be very, very scared, right? And as regards legal action, right, you're going to need to put a deposit down of £500,000, okay? And when you lose the case, you're going to have to pay all kinds of dough, right? So, legal action... Bring it on, Tony Connolly, right? Because everything I have said is true, and I will call the police records, right, of all of these things that I've um, been mentioning, which will support everything, and I will produce witnesses, right, to say that everything that I've said is true. Because you didn't only tell me about these things, like the Hasties thing. Yeah, Alan Walk, the friend, knows about when you raped that little girl with fucking um, Scotch John. Right, so don't start all that nonsense. And you even spoke about it in front of me and um, Dobby, Alan, Walk, the friend. Right, so you really want to bring this on? You want to turn that spotlight on you, right? Like in the Lord of the Rings, dear? Hey, well, bring it on then. You know what I mean? Okay. Right. So then we can see how we go then. Hey, is that what we want to do? All right, Tony, bring it on.